The following program is made possible by the friends and partners of Time of Grace. Does God listen to you when you pray? How do you know that? One long-running argument that people get into is which is more valuable to the human being, the sense of sight or the sense of hearing? Well, I tell you what, I don't want to get caught into that because I'd be dreadfully disappointed in my own life to lose my skill at either one. I, I love and need both. But I'll tell you what, more people are wired to communication through talk and hearing than through sight. There are plenty of people in the world who are illiterate, but almost everyone has the ability to speak and to hear. Now, where this really becomes kind of an ache is that we are unable at this point to see God or hear his voice directly. Ever since Adam and Eve launched their first rebellion against God, they were cast out of the Garden of Eden where they had immediate and direct contact. Now it is our lot as sinful human beings to live in a detached relationship with God. And so our connector to him, the way in which we can communicate is of great urgency. Now, for the last couple of weeks, I've been talking to you about the Advent drama, the prepare for Christ drama that God built into the design of his tabernacle. And the third of our steps as we go into, in our mind and heart of faith, as we go into the holy place of the tabernacle, is the beautiful golden table at the far end of the room. And it is there that God designed a way for people to know that they could communicate with God and he would promise to hear them. All our relationships are wired for the human voice. Many people cannot read. They're illiterate, but they are not without language. They can communicate. They can hear and speak. It is also the most basic feature of our relationship with our God that we must have if we're not going to be sick or dead in our spirit. The back and forth communication of hearing him and knowing that he hears us is vital if we are going to feel successful and feel like our lives are okay and worth something, if we can make it through this crazy life. But because of our sin, Adam and Eve basically gave God a stiff arm and said, we can't trust you, we don't believe you, you're lying to us, you're cheating us out of things we have a right to. We don't want you way up here and us way down here. We think we'll be better off without you. And that horrible decision brought about a distance where we no longer can see. But the word of God still comes to us and he still listens. But God has to teach us how to interact with him during this time of separation. Soon enough when he returns, when you're in heaven with the Lord, there will be no barrier and we will interact with God directly. Now there is a distance and God needed to teach the Israelites as he needs to teach us how to manage that distance between us and God. Because if you don't know how to manage it, it will drive you crazy and Satan will see to it that you despair, become depressed and give up and assume uh, that you will, coming out of your lips, will be the cry of uh, Boomers Help Me Out Here, Pink Floyd in their second most famous album, The Wall. Uh, you know, the wall, you know, is a symbol of everything horrible that boxes you in. And so they utter this terrible plaintive cry, Hey, is there anybody out there? And Satan says, No, you're alone, sucker. It's a scam. You're alone. Nobody hears. Nobody cares. Nobody is going to do anything. God begs to disagree. And he designed his first meeting place with the Israelite people as a gigantic drama to help them understand how to overcome the distance and have a relationship. God is a bundle of contradictions. And there's no other way to put it because 
it, it is, seems to be a paradox. The Bible teaches us two things about God that seem to be contradictory and you cannot resolve them and you must not try because if you denature either one, you will wreck the message and have a distorted picture of God. The Bible says that God ferociously punishes all sin and simultaneously asserts without a trace of irony that God also forgives all sin. And that might drive you crazy. If you work your brain on that too long and try to crack that nut all by yourself, it will drive you crazy. You'd say, well, one or the other, which is it? And the truth is it is both. And the tabernacle expressed in visual terms that a child could understand, expressed how God could have it both ways, and they're both true. The last two weeks, we've taken a little bit of tour past fire number one and fire number two. God was distant from the Israelite people, but came to tent among them. And you might say, that's a contradiction. How can he be near and far away at the same time? Well, he pitched his tabernacle right in the middle of this gigantic mass movement of three million people. And here was this little fenced-in courtyard made out of animal skins and poles that were staked to the ground. And inside that courtyard, about a quarter of the size of a football field, was a rectangular tent, 15 feet wide, 45 feet long, 15 feet high, with some kind of framework uh, made out of wood, 48 acacia wood structural poles that had sockets and clips and you would, uh, you would assemble it into a, a skeleton and then throw animal skins over the top. First layer was linen, second red wool, third skins from sea mammals. Tanned leather sea mammal skin was st stitched together to make the overcovering. And at Mount Sinai, where they were camped now, a nationless people who were nomads, they stayed there for many, many months and set up what I call Sinai City. That not just was people camping, but they actually had trade areas and they carried on work, carried for their animals, but also, as we'll soon hear, they had foundries for gold and bronze and they had blacksmith shops and they had bakeries and they had looms and spinning, some sort of spinning uh, equipment of whatever, I don't know if it's a wheel like we think of a spinning wheel, but they knew how to spin and they had looms for weaving that were set up for some large-scale weaving projects. And God uh, laid out for them how I want you to design the space where you will meet me. Two weeks ago, we talked about fire number one, the gigantic seven by seven, constantly burning barbecue pit that was basically just an open latticework structure of a wood skeleton which must have charred and gotten, the inside must have gotten charred up and burnt out pretty quickly, but that just provided the skeleton, the shape for the bronze which coated it and that's what held it all together in the heat of the burning. That's where the animals would be burnt up. That is how God showed I am punishing sin and he took it out on the animals instead of on the people. That is the beauty and the wonder of God. He punishes sin but does it on a substitute. And he wanted them to see that over and over so that they would get it. Here is how I punish sin and forgive it at the same time. I will take out my vengeance for your crimes but on someone else and then I can announce forgiveness upon you. And the first message that you would see when you were allowed to go past the flaps and walk into that courtyard is the message that the blood of the animal has washed you clean. You are now considered holy before God, holy enough to step into his place, holy enough to live your life without fear. Of course, they had to do it over and over because no animal can take away any sin that you've ever done. Those animals were nothing but stand-ins. They were placeholders for Christ and that is why we no longer need to slaughter animals for the Lamb of God has been slain once and for all. But that altar... The, both the slayer and the slain both represented what Christ was going to do on Good Friday on Mount Calvary. Fire number one was a fire of forgiveness. God's vengeance, but God's forgiveness is pronounced. Last week I talked to you about fire number two. The oil lamps which were lit on the inside. A central golden lamp stand and seven oil cups with wicks. 
that would be lit every evening so that all night long there would be light shining inside that dark room, the first room of the tent into which only the priests could go. Across from it, what it was illuminating was a representation of the people, the bread of the presence, it was called. The people were allowed, not personally, you couldn't go in there. In fact, part of the message of judgment and severity and respect of God was that if you go in, you will die. He told the priests, if you don't wash in the washstand, you will die. If you touch the Ark of the Covenant, you will die. In fact, if you even touch any part of Mount Sinai, you're going to die. But through a substitute, through a symbol, through a stand-in, their presence was represented by that, those loaves of bread, 12, one for each tribe. And all week long, those loaves were illuminated all night long by God whose those cups signified his eyes and his smile. He was looking at the people and loving and blessing the people all night long. Then in the morning they would extinguish him. After a week, you might think that bread would be pretty stale by then. I, th I think that, um, that God could keep it still tasty because the priests would eat the bread after they'd been in there a week. It, right in there, right in the room. Twelve priests would each munch away. They would consume the bread. So I hope that God would not force them to eat something that was as dry and hard as a rock, that he wouldn't torment them with something inedible. Uh, but they would eat it. And you know, that showed everything. It's all good inside that place. Even though the people for now are being kept at arm's length, the message those priests were to bring is it's all good. The sacrifices have been made we can eat together. You don't have people over at your house to sit at your table who are your enemies or who you're afraid of, do you? When you eat and you sit down, you let go of all your tension, all your fears, all your suspicions. You only want friends around your table because there's a bonding when you have a meal. And the eating of bread in the presence of God is like a little clue, a little hint of the wonderful supper of the Lord that we enjoy today and the great message of the Lord's Supper which is our way of interfacing with God today is it's all good people he loves you and in fact he's bonding with you physically through his body and blood the price paid to make you one now there was a third item in that holy place the place only the priests could go twice a day they go in there once in the morning to, to snuff the, the oil lamps, once in the evening to light them again. But one thing that they would also do is that was the place for the burning of incense. And in the, the end of the, at the far end of the room, right up against the curtain that kept people out of the hiding place for the Ark of the Covenant was a table not much bigger than this, just about the size of this, made of acacia wood and overlaid with gold. The instructions for that table are in Exodus chapter 30, uh, starting at verse 1. Why don't you look it up in your Bible, if you would, so that you know how to find it. God said, make an altar of acacia wood. And you say, that's not an altar, it's just a little table. That's really all it was, it was a little bitty table. A, a cubit square, like from my tip of my elbow to the middle finger here, that's a cubit. So like about 18 inches square, all the, it only had one function where there was a dish on the top of it, you would put burning coals on there and then they were to sprinkle incense on that little table. It's to be square, a cubit long, a cubit wide, two cubits high, in other words about three feet high. It's horns of one piece with it. So there need to be little projecting bits in the corners, right in the corners of the table, make the gold come up into a point, overlay it, top and all sides with pure gold, make a gold molding around it. Two gold rings for the altar below the molding to hold the poles used to carry it, because I don't want you touching it. Carry it with poles. Make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Put the altar in front of the curtain that's before the Ark of the Testimony, before the atonement cover that's over the testimony where I will meet with you. So here's our portal of communication. Aaron must burn fragrant incense on the altar every morning when he tends the lamps. He must burn it again when he lights the lamps in the evening. And so that is what Aaron would do. He would put the incense, it would be ground up into a fine powder, said make it the work of a perfumer. Had secret recipes, secret formulas, 
This particular formula was to be used only for this particular function. You could make it out of wood bark or wood shavings like cedar. If you, have you ever burned cedar wood or bark? Very aromatic and fragrant, isn't it? It has a beautiful aroma. makes your whole house or backyard smell good. They had resins or gums that could be scraped off certain desert plants. It was very hard to get. And you only could get like a drop off each plant, so it took a long time. It had to be dried out to a semi-resinous texture, and you'd put that together and grind it up into a powder or sometimes pack it into little cakes. And it had a very fragrant aroma. We don't use it as much as we used to back in my day, back in the hippie era uh, long ago. We used to use a lot of incense, and frankly, in the boys' dorm, the guys' dorm where I lived, it was a mighty good thing. Uh, many of you have never experienced a guy's dormitory, but uh, there are bad smells in a building with that many young men who are not constant about washing their bed sheets and their dirty socks are decorative furniture as they see it. And burning some incense would help overcome the reek of other things that were not so nice. And that symbolizes the two things that incense provide as a visual, although and at your uh, keep your distance visual. Nobody saw this but the priest. They had to be told this is happening. The ordinary people never saw the golden table. It only was told to them verbally, and then when they were able to read it in, as the Bible was written down, they could read Exodus for themselves too and realize what was going on inside there. But two powerful things happen when you burn incense. One, as I said, it smells real good. Second, as you can see before you, the smoke rises. This is the communication center of the Israelite people. And it's a symbol of Jesus Christ who is your interface, your portal of communication with your God. Jesus said, I am the way, truth, and life. I am your intercommunication node or hub. No one comes to the Father but by me. And what was designed in the tabernacle was only a setup for people to grasp the concepts of why Christ is so important. This was a pre-Christian temporary structure set up to teach people the concept. But the concept is this, when the sacrifice has been made, when the substitute has been slain, you may approach me. The seven lamps of my presence are looking at you and smiling. The bread of your presence is representing you and you can live in here without dying, without being killed. Now come farther to fire number three, burn some incense and realize that yes, there is somebody out there. These are the three important things the Israelites needed to know to live in peace. Fact number one, someone is listening to me. My prayers the urgings and pleas of my heart don't just clunk on the ground like a glider. You know, if you uh, went back in grade school, I think every grade school child who's ever lived, at least the boys, make gliders out of pieces of paper. And you throw them and they, they zing around the room and then fall down. If you think of your prayers like your grade school gliders where you write on there what you need to survive, what, what the pain in your heart of what is going on in your life, and you try to throw it up to heaven, it'll zig around and crash. Is that how you see your prayers? God did not want Israel to think their prayers were crashing to the ground. Someone is listening. Second, promise number two, the listener cares because he likes you. That sweet smell isn't smelling for God. God smells fine. We're the ones with the odor problem. We're the ones who are afraid that our sinful, rancid lives may make us so repulsive that God will sweep us away and condemn us. We all have that fear. We all feel the depression and fear of death and fear of judgment. The incense is a reminder we smell good to God. He likes having us around because the room smells better when we're in it to God. Isn't that an awesome thought? He cares about us and likes having us around. Third, what are you going to do about it? The prayers make it there because as the smoke rises, it's a visual that your prayers don't clunk to the ground. They go up 
are registered and get processed by one who cares and he acts. He always answers our prayers, waits to be asked because he has things to do and to give us, but waits to be asked in order that there might be some interaction so that we can interface and participate in his running of the world. That is a preposterously unbelievable concept. But the, the regular double daily ritual of the burning of the incense was a visual that the people could have in mind that they were now able to interact with God, bringing their praises, and he wouldn't laugh at them or brush them off. He would welcome their worship. He would hear and, and assure them of forgiveness of their sins. When they came in guilt, they would hear words of pardon. Third, when we come with our aching personal needs, he cares and acts. And fourth, when we come and intercede for someone else, he allows us to make good things happen for other people. Call that the concept of intercession. So fire number three is the fire that guarantees that our prayers are welcome and functional before God. This Advent drama that God set up for the Israelites wasn't just for them. I hope you think about these things and I hope you let them teach you things as well. Let them answer your three aches in your heart. Is anybody listening to me? The answer is yes. Smell the incense. Yes, he's listening. See the smoke rise. Your prayers do rise clear all the way to heaven. Through your faith in Jesus, you are guaranteed access to the throne of God. Claim that and cherish it as one of your Advent hopes. Second, does he care about me? The, the Advent of Christ shows how much he cares. That he came to be incarnate wrapped in swaddling cloths, not beautiful wrapping paper and foil, the way some of your presents will be under your tree. But the greatest gift you will ever receive is the wrapped up Savior who came in person to give you a happy relationship with God. Does he like me? Smell the incense. Smell it in your mind. I smell good to God. My sins are washed away. He likes hearing from me. He loves to speak to me, but he loves to listen to me too. And I don't make him sick. He's not sick of me. He's not contemptuous of me. He doesn't hate me. He loves me. Jesus loves me. And finally, the promise of action. He guarantees to process every message you send in a way that fits his agenda for other people and in a way that fits his agenda for you. He may not grant every detail of what you asked for, especially not in the time frame you may want or have specified. But on his time and in his way, everything you bring to him will be processed. And what makes this all worthwhile, even though he knows all your needs in advance, is he intentionally is holding back from doing even more for you because he's waiting to be asked. That's the great news of fire number three. That your God is listening. That your God cares. That your God acts. Let all God's people say, Amen. Have you ever noticed that in the tabernacle design that God built, there are four levels of fire before you reach him? God represented himself as a burning, and you would encounter him as you would step into it. As you stepped into the courtyard, you could see the constant fire and smoke rising from the sacrifices being offered and burnt up on the great big bronze altar of sacrifice that was on the outside. That was the shedding of the blood and the destruction of this tissue as a way for God's anger to be poured out on the substitute and not on you. 
as you would step in as a priest, you would step into the holy place. There would be the burning of the oil lamps, shedding their light, the light of God's presence, the light of his smile upon the people represented by the bread. The fire that was burning the incense was not an anger fire or a judgment or punishing or consuming fire. It was a happy fire because it set smoke up to represent the prayers and messages of the people going to God and the beautiful smell was an assurance that we smell good to God. Behind the curtain was the burning fire of the pillar of cloud and fire that represented the very presence of God himself. The Bible calls it the glory of the Lord. And it was only through Christ that you may enter all the way for a personal relationship with that glory. Don't go away. I'm going to be back in just a minute to pray with you. Would you like a resource to help you in your personal planning and renewal in the new year? then we'd love to send you a Grace Moments Devotions book for January through March. These daily readings will provide you with a little scripture and life application to encourage and sustain your faith each day. This book is available for your best gift. Call today or visit timeofgrace.org slash door to request your copy. This gives me a chance to be with you for just a moment and say thank you for your gifts of financial support. I have to tell you, not only is this absolutely vital to the continued existence of Time of Grace, we wouldn't even be having this conversation if your gifts had not made possible the purchase of this airtime. But it also does a great deal for me personally to know that you approve of and appreciate and love to receive the messages from Time of Grace. If you have not yet so far this year made your own personal gift of financial support for Time of Grace, let me ask you today, right now, to pray and consider becoming part of our support team. Look at me right in the eyes. I need your help. Come and help me make Jesus look good through mass media. I also want to come before you today and invite your prayers. This is a great ministry that we have, and I'd like to ask you today to join me in prayer for Time of Grace. Dear Lord, we are honored that you give us your words so that we can hear you, and we're thrilled that you, through Christ, guarantee that you hear us. Thank you for listening to our prayers. Help us, all of us in the Time of Grace team, our workers and our financial supporters, to gather together, band our strength together, so that we may make the name of Jesus great in the world and that more and more people through him will enter into God's approval and joy and know that their prayers are heard and answered. In Jesus' name, we dare to pray. Amen. For Time of Grace, I'm Pastor Mark Jeske reminding you every day is a day of God's amazing grace for you. Helping you reach the next level of your Christian life is a driving passion for Mark Jeske and the ministry team at Time of Grace. When you visit timeofgrace.org, you'll find more resources than ever, including video extras, social media connections, new products, plus our prayer ministry, all at timeofgrace.org. And pray about becoming a Grace Partner, an exclusive group of partners and donors who are committed to help us expand Mark Jeske's teaching ministry around the world. Just call 1-800-661-3311 or visit us at timeofgrace.org. Thanks for watching. And join us again next time for Mark Jeske and Time of Grace. The preceding program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Time of Grace.